the director, so if you could stand by. <laughs> Camera, get it together. All right. Good. Are you having fun, Jay? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this looks horrible. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the writer director of Doctor Ian Dragons. Woo! Right. Hello. And yeah, we'll open up to questions. And we'll start with you. Go ahead. Case he's being groomed to become chief, and that just seems like a very dull and, uh, and and bad fit for him as a future. So it's it's about him um, really discovering that that kind of that other half of his soul that's kind of lurking out there in the world, and uh, he expresses that by constantly mapping and going deeper into uncharted lands, finding new dragons and finding new conflicts. Second part of the question, um, yes, Hiccup is I'm sorry, Toothless is a very unique dragon, and I think that uh, Hiccup is as curious as to whether or not they will find another Night Fury out there in their travels, but um, that has yet to be uh, seen whether or not it will pay off. <laughs> Our next question in all the room there. Go ahead. Uh, can you talk about the uh, inventions in the home and uh, the relation to uh, people from Hiccup? Yeah, oh, well, that, you know, that was, we, we had hoped that that was going to be a fun reveal for the movie. <laughs> but now that it's out there, uh, yeah, I think part of, part of Hiccup realizing that there's, there's a, a part of him that's missing is kind of drawn out from the first movie, this idea of what happened to his mother, and uh, where was she? And so we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if she's been missing for 20 years? And in those 20 years, like Diane Fossey, she's been living among dragons and learning their ways and discovering their secrets and and becoming their fierce protector. And if Hiccup were to run into that person, well, of course, then, you know, there's this other side of him that's just living this intense, uh, interesting, dragon-centric life. Um, no wonder, you know, he's this dragon whisperer and such a, a, square, a square peg. So it's, um, it's, it's really about kind of ex expanding his own self-discovery. Next question, right here. Great. Um, so... Since this is a franchise that's also had a great life on television as well, what are the different kinds of stories that you think fit better for the film universe versus for the television landscape? Well, I, I, you know, D Dean had pointed out earlier that uh, one, one of the cool things about the TV show is that we get to sort of uh, go a bit more everyday life type of thing. You know, we, we don't have enough screen time just in the movies. You know, we have a very specific finite amount of time that things have to happen in in the movies. And what the TV show gives us is it gives us a chance to put um, the audience in that neighborhood, on that island, experiencing the sort of minutia of everyday life, what it is to be a Viking on Berg. Um, and uh, I'll let him talk about what he thinks would make a good movie. <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the idea of doing a sequel needed to be necessary to me. And I think that there were enough unanswered questions in the first movie that it did feel it did feel there was more story to be told but um, my pitch was that it be a trilogy so that it can be the middle act of a three act story and that it will culminate in a very finite way uh, in much the way that, that Cressida's Cowell's books and you know so the, the disappearance of dragons and, and kind of what happened to them and, and Hiccup's completion as uh, his, his coming of age so there's a lot of interesting stuff there a lot lots to explore and I think that um, 
the stories kind of write themselves. The moment that you leave the island of Burke and venture off into this rich world that Crescent of Cowell created, uh, where there are different types of dragons with different abilities all over the place, it, it's, uh, it's just a fun world to live in and very easy to write, actually. Thanks. So, uh, I guess it's rare to see that happen when you see a, a TV spinoff made for these movies and you see the star of the movie, you know, comes back and then in the same character and goes, well, how did that come up and, uh, and how, did, you know, how do you think it's worked out where you get to see and pick up all of the movies and the show as well? Well, for me, there was just, uh, uh, there was no question that I... I didn't want anyone else to play him. Like that's, I, I think part of an actor's job is to take ownership of the character and to be defensive and protective and all that stuff. And so um, when there was even the first mention that Hiccup might have a life on television, it had to be me, um, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and uh, what, what, it's, what it's really cool about the TV show is it kind of takes place in between the two movies. And so, when all is said and done, and we walk away, we'll have given the world a pretty full, complete story. And um, selfishly, it's it's uh, it's kept me in that mind space. And so, like a lot of people have been asking, what it's like to come back to this character and come back to this world. And my answer has constantly been, I never left. And so, um, yeah, I just love that that we have we're creating this kind of pretty uh, pretty deep open platform multi media world um, and so so yeah no I what it all comes down to is yeah I just didn't want to know else to play him <laughs> Thank you. nor would we <laughs> thank you that's good news um how do I get ready for it uh, I, 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 my getting ready involves uh, waking up, taking a shower, and going in there. Sometimes I don't even shower because I don't have to. I don't have to put makeup on or costume or anything. Um, I may actually sometimes I give myself a cool mission. I try to not shower for two weeks if I know I'm gonna have to be in a room with him for a few hours. Um, but uh, but no, I I adore it. It was kind of when I started acting when I was 12, um, which is strangely 20 years ago. Um, I. Uh, my first, one of the first gigs I had was in dubbing, and dubbing shows from France into English um, uh, in Montreal, and if you can do dubbing, you can do any of it. Dub dubbing is about as thankless and labor intensive as voice acting gets, and so this is just a dream, and, and I love it because like, I have a pretty, you know, overactive imagination, I'm a chronic daydreamer, and being in that booth, that's what's required, you know, because there's no actual dragons in front of me, nor, nor anywhere in the world, I suspect. Um, and so, so yeah, no, it just kind of, it kind of caters to what I love to do. And also at this point, I don't know how many years I've been working with him. I was seven, eight, seven, seven, seven yeah. Um, we just kind of have a shorthand and, and you know, I, I just, I much prefer to take notes from him than most people. 